The scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Robin. God bless you. I don't normally do this during worship, but I'd like to take a moment before we enter into a time of meditation and discernment of the Word uh, to give a shout out uh, to all the people the last month who have poured their hearts and leadership into the ministries of this church. There are too many to name. I'm looking at countless musicians right now who practiced and prepared and showed up early and wore hot robes while the rest of us wore normal clothes. Um, Twelve uh, men in this church practiced it's countless hours to be able to be prepared to stand in for the 12 disciples in Jesus Christ, and especially for Cameron Graham, who had to play Judas. That's a hard one. Um, but the thing that stands out to me mostly is uh, the night of our vigil, most people don't know this, the night of our vigil, we hired a security company to keep watch over the parking lot so we have a few spots to use and we're safe and all. Um, they put us down at the, for the wrong date, and Jim Evans discovered that right when we were starting. Jim Evans after spending all week uh, serving and helping and assisting, ended up going home, grabbing his dog, and coming up and sitting in our parking lot to about 6 in the morning. Uh, he, he's out of town. That's the only reason I can say this. Um, I just want to take a moment to point out how many people have diligently, behind the scenes, poured out um, and been willing to carry a burden uh, for the sake of the ministries of the church. Things don't happen uh, seamlessly without that kind of work. And so for all the people here today who serve in that way, thank you so much. And may we continue to encourage each other. God bless us all. Let us pray. Father, now in the name of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, which he promised to give through the proclamation of the gospel so that we don't have to make anything up, we ask that all of these would align, and today you would once again pour into me the Holy Spirit gift of preaching and into our congregation gathered today the Holy Spirit gift of being hungry for your word and believing it when we hear it. Bless and keep us all, mature us, and grow us until we walk into the resurrection ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. So this is a, a popular story. Um, normally, it's where Thomas gets the name Doubting Thomas, which probably isn't all that fair. 
Um, in fact, one of our disciples at the Living Last Supper, his famous line was, why do people remember my doubting, but they don't remember my daring? Uh, Thomas was not marked with any more doubt than the other disciples. Uh, Peter, God, help him. Uh, <laughs> all of them uh, acted with lack of faith, with lack of disciple, with, la- with lack of, uh, of, of faith, and with lots of doubting. So this morning, what, what, what I'd like to do is, before we get into uh, three closing points that I believe are critical, uh, let's do a little clarifying of what happened that day and the days leading up to when Thomas encountered the Lord. First, you have the women who had their encounter with Jesus Christ, and they ran to the disciples, and their words were, we have seen him. And next thing you know, the men who didn't believe the women, like Thomas, had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and when Thomas came back from whatever errand he was running, don't you feel bad for him for that? He was out of town. He came back in town, walked in, and the disciples repeated the women by saying, we have seen him. We've seen him. Now, there's two words in Greek for seen, and they're used just about equally throughout the New Testament. One word is blepo, which means to look at, to see, to witness. The other is horao, which means to come into contact at a deeper level with something that it gets inside of you. Countless people can blepo something. They can go see the same event and not be moved by it. I mean, how many times do you see someone on the side of the road with their car broken down, and you're not internally moved by that? Or you see a homeless man on the street that needs money, and you're not moved by that. That's blepo. That's to see something, to acknowledge something as is, and yet it doesn't get in you. Hurao is to see something in such a way that it's an actual intimate encounter where you see it with your eyes probably, but you definitely see it with your heart. The women had horao. They encountered the Lord at such a piercing level that the world as they knew it was over. St. Paul, years later, walking on the road to Damascus to go persecute the church, had an encounter with the Lord at such a deep level that it was horao. It got inside of him, and his religion was over. He was no longer a Pharisee, a Jew. He was a Jesus proclaimer, a Christian. The women had hurao. They had this internal, massive shifting when they encountered the Lord. The disciples of Jesus Christ, the ten, Judas had departed and Thomas was out of town. They encountered the Lord that was more than seeing. They had hurao. They had an encounter with Jesus that got inside of them that they couldn't unsee. And then there was Thomas. So the first thing I'd like to point out is that what happened when Thomas was out of town wasn't simply seeing Jesus. It was Jesus showing himself in such a way that no human could make him do it. It was his freedom to show up in his timing in such a manner that fundamentally shifted the lives of others in the same way that he fundamentally showed up in Cage's life and changed his heart. They didn't make him do it. Christ blessed them with it. So that's clarification number one. The difference between just simply seeing something versus coming to encounter God on his terms in such a way that you are changed. And the second is that Jesus makes a clarifying remark that I think is critical to the church today. He says something to Thomas that we might breeze past. First, he refers to Thomas as being blessed because he sees and he believes. But then he said there's another generation, multitudes of people that are coming later who don't require sight before they believe. When Christ Jesus was raised from the dead, the Father sent an angel to preach the gospel the first time. And then systematically, Jesus openly revealed himself to apostles, to preachers, to pastors, to teachers. But the most important revelation was to the people that we call apostles, biblical apostles. Peter, James, John, St. Paul, Matthew, Luke, 
Jesus appeared to the apostles. It was important that the first generation of Christians who would be pinning the Bible, that would be preaching the first sermons, that would be disciplining the church and making sure we didn't spin off into heresy, we know how quickly a good religious idea can quickly spin off into crazy talk. The first generation, the rock of disciples, the rock of apostles, had to be people who had a physical, visible, real encounter with Jesus. They had to see and touch and feel and know. That was critical because even though those men were fallible, doubters, sinners, hypocrites, later Peter refused to eat with Gentiles and St. Paul got into a fight with him, they were hypocritical in action. The apostles were smitten with Jesus so that the message would be infallible. The message would be perfect. Isn't it good to know that the message of Jesus Christ isn't dependent on a preacher living a perfectly moral life? Thank God. Isn't it good to know that the truth of the resurrection of Jesus isn't dependent on the church? What's the saying? We don't drink, dance, or do, chew, or go with girls that do, right? Isn't it great? that the message of Jesus isn't dependent upon the ethics and morals of the church? Isn't it great that the religion we're in, it doesn't boil down to rules, it boils down to grace? He showed himself to the first generation of preachers and teachers and by highest means, apostles, the builders of the church. He showed himself. It was necessary that they see him. Every one of them did. And so let's get off Thomas for a minute. Because Peter had to see, James had to see, Paul had to see, Thomas had to see. They had to touch, they had to encounter him. That's number one. They had to have a hara'o encounter with Jesus Christ at the deepest level so that the root of the church would be founded on absolute, unfiltered, infallible truth proclamation. That Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, that he taught, he was persecuted, crucified, died for our sins, and on the third day was resurrected to be ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. That message is absolutely God's property that he gave to those apostles, and it hasn't changed. That's number one. Why did the apostles have to see Jesus? So that the message would never be confused. And if you read the New Testament, there was diversity in the early church. Disciples like to point that out. Yes, there was diversity in the early church, but there was only one gospel. There wasn't a gospel to the Corinthians and a gospel to the Philippians and a gospel to the Ephesians. There was one gospel that through Jesus Christ and faith in him, you have eternal life. One gospel proclaimed by God himself through his son Jesus Christ to those apostles that included touching his side. But number two, clarifying, is that then Jesus said, but blessed are they who believe and don't require sight. He's talking about you. The burden of the first leadership in the church is that they had to see for the sake of the message and the gift of not living in that period. How many of you say, I wish I lived when Jesus lived. I wish I was one of his first disciples. Then I would have stronger faith. No. (laughs) That's not how this works. Jesus, in fact, said the ones following will have stronger faith because they don't require sight. And that there's an entire generation of people who will be gifted from on high with the Holy Spirit who are able to put weight on the testimony that the apostles originally received. One generation had to receive it. All the following get to trust what they heard. You're a superhero. You don't have to see. You don't have to touch. You don't have to smell. You don't have to have a physical encounter with Jesus Christ before you believe. Christ on high gives you that gift of faith so that you can lean on what was told to the apostles. You see that? Isn't this cool? 
When we're talking about the story that we call Doubting Thomas, let's change that. Let's take that title away. And let's call it the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the promise of countless people following who by faith alone can rest in it. And so there are three things to walk away with from a story like this, from a truth like this. The first one is that there is modern day blepoism versus hurraoism. Blepo again means we want to see something. We want we are hungering for that fireworks show. We are wanting the big display. We're saying, I want to put my hands in his side and I want to feel the the the, the stigmata, the mark in his hand. I want to have this moment. Blepo. I want to have an external moment to come into contact with Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't show himself that way. He shows himself through hara'o, through wild, brilliant encounters with him that he alone is free to offer. I have yet to meet the right rain dance person to do a rain dance over a church and then revival comes. In the universe, the only truly free person is God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He shows up on his terms and his ways, and when he does in your life, that is a hurrah moment. That's an encounter moment with the Lord Almighty. And the number way that God has given the church ability to have encounter with him is to have the gift of faith and then to begin to see correctly through the preaching, the singing, the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, through scripture study, through walking in the Spirit. You are that generation that Jesus talked about that will be able to receive the gift of faith and then see correctly. The world tells you first we'll see, then we'll believe. Jesus says, no, 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 no. First you'll believe and then you'll see. First you'll receive the gift of faith to lean back on all the things your grandmama taught you about Jesus and you just trust it for the first time. There are too many people with PhDs on the details and they never lean back on it. Faith is about optimistic attraction and trust in God. Not, not knowing a lot about God, but knowing God. Faith enables us to lean back when we lean back, hara'o happens. We have moments of experiences of God during Holy Week. Last week is a, is, is a minefield of hara'o's experience where through preaching, through song, through proclamation, it's like you saw Jesus on the cross, wasn't it? It's as if you actually saw in your heart's eye Jesus raised from the dead. You get to see in your spirit Christ alive. The gospel changing lives. And Jesus would tell us that encounter internally is the only true encounter. What you see with your eyes aren't going to get you there. So number one is to ask God by faith for hara'o. To see Christ because you already have faith in Him. Not to see Christ in order that you have faith in Him. He doesn't owe you that. Number two is the reality that no amount of evidence will ever produce faith. No amount of evidence will ever produce faith. We could, we could dig up and find all the artifacts in the world. We could have the most compelling speeches ever. We can have the PhDs come in here and offer their PowerPoint presentations. We could do all sorts of things. That doesn't make you attracted to God. It doesn't make you attracted to God. There's a tendency for us to slip over into that St. Thomas mentality to pretend that we are the first generation of apostles and that God owes us some evidence. But he has made it clear that first you will receive the gift of faith from on high, you will trust in me, and then you'll see me everywhere. So number one is that we see God through faith. Number two is to get over the evidence thing because no amount of evidence will give you faith and no amount of evidence that you display will give other people faith. I wish it were that easy. I wish we could control God like that. 
but he shows up on his own terms and his own giftings. And number three, all this combined means that one of our greatest stumbling blocks is our ability to see. We have a modern culture who lives by this truth that we receive truth by sight and we think with our feelings. I don't know about you, uh, but my feelings have gotten me in trouble before. You trust your feelings? We live in a modern culture of stimulation and sensitivities to the world and that we refuse to believe anything unless we see it. And our standard for right and wrong is what we feel. And so we walk around this world using compasses and navigation that have never produced truth. They've just produced popularity. We build a God in our image. We build a gospel in our image, a religion in our image. And Jesus Christ came and died and bled and was resurrected so that no longer will we have to rely on our feelings, on our need to see. Instead, he offered us the mystery of God so that anyone who puts their faith in him and quits trying to be impressive and proving themselves, puts their faith in Jesus alone, they receive life, and then the wise who refuse to will be counted as fools in the end. You are incredibly gifted to live when you live on this side of the cross. I am too. On this side of the gospel proclamation, the truth of Jesus Christ, God dispenses out faith as such a precious gift and we blow by it. You get to live in the assurance we have in Jesus Christ. You get to be part of the generation that Jesus prophesied about that will believe even though they don't see. Why do we keep trying to rely on the things that won't get us there? And it's all in the Bible. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, your own sight. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will actually lead your life. The great things that have happened by submission to God, the great things that will happen in Cage's life and any other baptized person's life, you can go put on that list from Hebrews chapter 13 and remember that God said through Scripture that all of these, these saints of the church, Abraham by faith believed God. It'd be funny if we switched them. Noah, by feelings, built the ark. King David, by sight, took the Philistines out. Enoch, by popular demand, believed in God. That's not how it works. Abel, by faith, gave a gift that was rendered as as righteous. Enoch, by faith, had a relationship with the Father. Noah, by faith, by heart, had a relationship with God to the point of submitting to build this wildly large ark. By faith, Abraham settled in the promised land. By faith, his son Isaac, and then his son Jacob, and then their sons. By faith, Moses led the people out of Israel. Not by sight. Moses didn't want to. Not by persuasion. Not by feeling. Not by popular demand. Not by vote. Not by education. But by faith. He leaned on the things of God, and God gave him life. May we quit trying to be Thomas and rather be like the people that Jesus told Thomas about. The people are coming who, though they don't believe, will love me, will trust me, will listen to me, will see me, and will live because they do it in their heart and they do it by faith. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this system you set up so that the first generation was responsible for hearing 
and proclaiming in such a way that it's all you. It's all your revelation. And then the following generations of the faithful are in no place to boast because we didn't choose this. We didn't come up with this. We can't lean on our own effort. Instead, we gave in to it. It's your gospel and your world and your redemption, Father. It's your Bible. This is your church. This is the day you have made. May we rejoice in that. In anything that we have, any revelation you give us in our heart, may we recognize that it's your blessing to us once we lean back in faith alone. May we know that you're not withholding from your children truth, but you're quick to give all who ask, but all who ask by faith. Forgive us our need, Lord, to control you, to prove you, and instead may we rest in everything you've already done on our behalf. Bless and keep all the baptized that we would walk by faith, that we wouldn't trust the other things as much as we once have, and instead, through faith alone, may mighty things occur in our lives for your kingdom. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.